I'm going to go ahead and introduce the authors that we have here this evening. Uh, Molly Antipal's debut story collection, The Un-Americans, won the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award, a 5 Under 35 Award from the National Book Foundation, and the Ribolo Prize. The book was long listed for the National Book Award and was a finalist for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction, the Barnes and Noble Discover Award, the National Jewish Book Award, California Book Award, the Sammy War Prize, and the Edward Lewis Wallant Award. So many accolades, Molly. Her writing has appeared in many journals and won a 2015 O. Henry Prize. She's the recipient of a Radcliffe Institute Fellowship at Harvard and a Stegner Fellowship at Stanford, where she teaches courses in fiction and nonfiction writing. Please welcome Molly. Uh, Leslie Tenoria's stories have appeared in The Atlantic, Zoetrope, All Story, Plowshares, Manoa, and the Best New American Voices and Pushcart Prize anthologies. A Wittig Writers Award winner and a former Stegner Fellow at Stanford University, he's received fellowships from the University of Wisconsin, Phillips Exeter Academy, Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Born in the Philippines, Leslie currently lives in San Francisco and is an associate professor at St. Mary's College. And his book, The Son of Good Fortune, is one of the reasons that we're here this evening. Please welcome Leslie. And Bruce Snyder is the author of three poetry collections, including Fruit, Paradise, Indiana, and The Year We Studied Women. He is co-editor of The Poems Country, Place, and Poetic Practice. His poems and essays have appeared in the American Poetry Review, Best American Poetry, Kenyan Review, Harvard Review, and Poetry, among others. His awards include a Mickener Fellowship, a Stegner Fellowship, the Jenny McKean Writer in, Resident, Writer in Washington Award, as well as residencies from Yaddo, the Malay Colony, the Amy Clampett House, the James Merrill House, and others. He is currently an associate professor at the University of San Francisco. Please welcome Bruce Snyder. Hi, everybody. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it away, Molly. Okay, so I think we're gonna, are we gonna do the reading first? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll just first thank you everybody. Thanks to uh, Green Apple, especially Car and Nick for organizing all this. Molly, thank you for taking time away from your vacation yes, to, thank to, you, Molly. to ask us, you know, probing deeply personal inappropriate questions later. <laughs> um, thanks to Julie and Echo, especially Caitlin for helping to arrange all of this. Um, do you wanna thank anybody? Yeah, I just wanna thank the University of Wisconsin who published my book. And especially Ron Wallace, who has been hey, a great Wallace. supporter and is just a, a wonderful guy. Great. And then just thanks to all our family and friends for, for showing yes. up. Thank um, you all for coming. Please in. say hi in the chat. So we're hoping we can save the chat. We can't see any of you. So we're hoping you, know, you can leave us a little message in the chat. Um, that would be great. Just a couple of things real quick. Um, as Carr said, 5 p.m. tomorrow, we will be doing a social distance in-person signing at Green Apple Books on 9th Avenue. And also, if you buy our books from Green Apple, and if you email us a picture of your receipt, we will send you a signed book plate in the mail so you can like stick it in your book. And I'll also send you a bookmark. Yeah. Um, these things alone are worth like $85. And I'm willing to send it and pay for yes. postage for free. And so it's too. quite a deal. It's quite a deal. We will send you. We'll send you these things. Signed, personalized. Yeah. Um, deeply personalized. Yeah. Written in blood. Yeah. So hopefully that's an incentive to support the books and support, especially support Green Apple, who have been awesome and they're just one of our favorite yes, places. We on love, the love, love Green Apple. So please support them. Um, so I think. We're gonna read each read for a little bit. You're gonna start, yeah. and then I'm gonna start, and then we'll have the quick cocktail tutorial, a uh, quick toast, and then Molly's gonna ask us questions. Yeah, okay. So Leslie's gonna leave so that you don't stare at him listening to me read. So I'm gonna read first, um, and, and I just wanna second. Thank you guys all for coming. I know that everybody is experiencing, I'm sure by now, a lot of Zoom fatigue. Um, everything has been happening on Zoom. So thank you for, for spending your Friday night with us. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm really just gonna read like three or four poems. It's not gonna be very long. Um, this, um, as we said, is fruit. Um, and in the book, you know, as much as poetry books are about any one thing, when people ask me about that, I always say that it's a book about not having kids. 
Um, and it's really kind of meditation. It kind of emerges out of actually in, in sort of my and Leslie's sort of discussions about do we want to have kids? Should we adopt kids? You know, what do we want to do? Um, and um, so it's a meditation on maybe the kind of losses and the uh, the pleasures um, of not having kids. Uh, so um, I think I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to start with one of the poems. Uh, there are a series of prose poems in the book. This is one of them. Um, it's called Childless. All of the poems are called Childless. And these are kind of just the, I think of it as kind of the spine of the book. And then the other poems are about a lot of other things, a lot about death, um, as poems often are about death. So uh, I'm going to read this one first. It's just, as I said, it's called Childless. And it has a little epigraph called At the Aquarium. The seahorse bobs alone in the tank. We study its long nose and thorny crown, the way its tail grasps the soft coral, a sign the male's brood pouch can hold over a thousand fertilized young. All day I imagine bodies inside my body, each leading to some new us. Later, when we play Scrabble, I spell desire, D-E-S-I-R-E. You add D for a triple word, feeling moved to the past tense. You laugh, tell me we're better off than most. It's been 10 years in this house, the spare room still unfinished, the garden a tangle of weeds. Sometimes I wish we were bowls, stackable, one nesting in the other. After dinner, we drive to play dolls with our goddaughter, push a truck along a plank of orange blocks until she laughs. In her books, we read how a squirrel feeds a bear from a honey pot, how a mother squid drifts in a cloud of ink, babies gathered in her improbable arms. Okay, so I'm going to read, um, there are a number of poems in the book that are inspired by science, sort of scientific facts, um, various things. I'm gonna read um, one of those and uh, this is a poem, it's called The Average Human, and it was inspired by the fact, and I, I read this years ago, um, uh, and thought maybe it was some kind of like a folk myth or something, um, that you know every time you take a breath, you inhale an atom from Caesar's last breath. But in fact, I read this article that said, in fact, that is based in science. Um, the way uh, oxygen molecules move through the air and spread out. So um, I'm gonna read that poem. And actually, this is a poem I wrote pre-COVID, um, but this idea of human breath, sort of in COVID, suddenly this poem kind of took on a different resonance, kind of the anxieties we have of breathing in other people's um, uh, air, right? Um, and, and also, I think, um, I think with the murder of George Floyd, too, and, and his last words being, um, I, uh, his last words being, I can breathe. So anyway, so this poem just, it's kind of been evolving for me. Um, so the average human. The average human breath contains approximately 10 to the 44 molecules, which once exhaled in time, spread evenly through the atmosphere. So today I took in the last breaths of James Baldwin, Marie Curie, Genghis Khan, my great great grandmother's breath, entering me beside the breath of a Viking slave boy immolated on the flames of his master's burning corpse. I inhaled African queens, Chinese emperors, the, hopeless, the homeless man with the bright blue coat down the street. If oxygen is the third most plentiful element in the universe, moving through us like Virgil through the underworld, how long have I tasted the girl drowned among cattails near the murky shore? In ancient Egypt, a priestess packed a corpse with salt but not before a breath escaped that 2,000 years later entered me, or at least atoms of it, a molecule. Plato theorized atoms in 400 BC, and this morning outside Athens, I took in his last breath, my lungs damp crypts where Charon's oars dipped into the black waters of the river Styx, not knowing who would pay the ferryman and with what coin on what tongue. Okay, so now I'm going to read 
another of the science poems that are in here. Um, it's a science poem, but it's also there are a number of poems in the book that are about bullies. Um, and this is one of them. So uh, it's called Chemistry. From the Middle Dutch word bolle, which means lover, bully was a term of endearment in the 16th century, which meant that a feudal lord could take the hand of his love under the apple trees in spring and exclaim, my bully, feeling adrenaline flood his body as his heart rate tripled and his palms begin to release, began to release water mixed with urea, ammonia, salt. Essentially, he could feel what I felt over four centuries later when Ian Starkey called me a fag. I was 14, and the next day he kicked me twice, spat in my face, took my glasses, and wouldn't give them back. And the whole time sweat glands were developing in our armpits and genitals, and our adrenals were releasing corticosteroids, and something about testosterone was why, though I hated him, I kept imagining him with his shirt off. True, Ian Starkey knew how to hurt me, but I doubt he knew why he was doing it. Or that we feel pain when neurons in the brain convert an electrical signal to a chemical signal and back again, which is also what allows us to feel a kiss. Or my brain to take strange comfort imagining all the boys of the world leaning into the strong arms of their tormentors in spring, under the apple blossoms, saying, I forgive you, saying, I can never forgive you, saying, my enemy, my bully, my love. And I'm just going to wrap things up with a poem. I've read this many times. It's an old poem. I, I actually, it was the very first poem I wrote when I moved to San Francisco. And I had left my, my, I had broken up with my ex and, um, and this was like over, you know, 16, 17 years ago. Um, I broke up with my ex and he had inherited the dogs and I was missing the, my dogs and I was missing my friends so much. And I'm going to dedicate this poem to my dear friend Beth Chapaton in uh, Austin. Uh, she appears in the poem. There is a Beth in the poem. Um, who, so Beth has, has been my muse for many, many years. And, and uh, the poem is called, It's the Dog. In the documentary about the man talking about his dead lover, it's the dog I feel saddest for. The way he roams the house, chewing the dead lover's slippers, scratching the back door. I don't know if it's grief the dog feels so much as a kind of confusion, which I guess is grief or an aspect of it. My neighbor Beth thinks dogs grieve the, the same way people do, but she also thinks the saddest thing in the documentary is the dead man's sister who can't stop cleaning things with ammonia-soaked rags, doorknobs, faucets, the porcelain tub. You could say Beth's more of a dog person, but she cried for days when she found her cat Lucy bloated and stinking in the tomato bed. She still dreams about Lucy, fat, lazy, slinking along the sliding glass door. Sometimes Lucy meows or whispers her name. Sometimes she floats into the trees, a hairy balloon. Beth isn't sure what this means, but wishes she knew. I wish the man in the documentary could stop carving the leg of lamb, crying. He doesn't know how to carve lamb. If his dog were mine, I'd rub his silky neck and give him a bone. When Beth comes by with her dog, sometimes she brings bones. Sometimes she's sad. Sometimes I am. Sometimes we play chase the ace or scrabble. We make dinner and talk about her dead cat or the movie we just saw. Sometimes we can't hear a thing with all the barking. Thank you guys so much. Thank you again for coming and, and spending time listening to us and, and sharing our celebration. So Leslie is now gonna read and I'm going to step out. Um, Hi everybody. Um, Okay, I'm just going to read a couple pages from my novel. So it's called The, the Son of Good Fortune. Um, it is about a young Filipino man named Excel and his mother Maxima. Um, they are both Filipino and they are undocumented. Um, they are what is called TNT, which stands for Tago Untago, which means hiding and hiding in Tagalog. Um, 
they kind of have a strange relationship. She is a former B action movie star from the Philippines, and he's kind of a kind of a lost young soul trying to make his way in a in a country that doesn't really want him or his mother. Um, so in the story, there's a flashback where Maxima uh, tells Excel that they are undocumented. She tells him on his 10th birthday when she takes him from their little apartment in Colma, which is right outside San Francisco, and decides to treat him today at Pier 39 on Fisherman's Wharf. Um, and so this, what I'm reading right now, is a flashback to when young Excel, 10 years old at the time, um, finds out that he is undocumented. <clears throat> and they're at Pier 39 looking at these sea lions um, over the water. They stood side by side against the metal rail. You're 10 years old now, Maxima said, so I'm gonna tell you something, and I don't want you to complain or whine or cry, you understand? I don't cry, he said. She looked over both shoulders, making certain no one was nearby, then back at Excel. We're not really here, she said. Who's not really here, he said. You, me, us, we're not supposed to be here. Beware, Excel said. Maxima paused like she couldn't name the place. America, she finally said, you and me, she bent down to meet his face or TNT. He pictured a stick of dynamite, the lit fuse, the explosion to come. TNT, she said, it's what you call a Filipino who's not supposed to be here. It stands for Tago and Tago. I don't understand you, he said. Tago means hiding. Ang means and. Tago and Tago, hiding and hiding. We're not hiding, he said. We are, she said, always. From who? She sighed as though there were too many ways to answer. Police, government, immigration, she said. But I was born here. She shook her head. I was born there. Excel meant the Philippines. Maxima shook her head again. Not here, not there meant nowhere. But we have, he searched for the term, green cards inside your desk. He'd seen his own green card before. A thumb-sized photograph of his face, the numbers with endless digits, the Statue of Liberty faded like a ghost. Peke, she said. Another Tagalog word he didn't know. Beke, fake. He thought for a moment like this was a problem he could solve. Your passport, he said, don't you have a passport? Sa Pilipinas lang, she said, doesn't mean anything in the States. He looked out at the sea lions. We're not American. No, she said. She looked suddenly tired and rubbed her eyes and tried to explain. She was eight months pregnant when she got rid of the eye patch wearing son of a bitch that's Excel's father, for drinking away half her savings, then blowing the other half of the Manila, at, blowing the other half on the Manila cockfight circuit. Despite her films, despite a Dynamite Star Manila Movie Award, there were no more acting jobs for her, no stunt work, nothing. And my only family, she said, was your Auntie Queenie, but she was a live-in maid in Saudi Arabia. Do you know how they treat Filipina maids out there? You think I'd do that to myself? To you? No way. Staying in the Philippines, unmarried and pregnant, she said, was unacceptable. Her best option was to call Joker. 15 years we didn't talk, and you know what he said when I called? Come to California, I'll help you. That's true family, believe me, Maxima said. He wired the money for a plane ticket, and a week, la a week later, I'm on my way to California. Thank God for Joker, my only hope, like Princess Leah and Obi-Wan, di ba? She smiled like that was supposed to make Excel feel better and salvage what was left of his 10th birthday. Then what happened, Excel asked. You, she said, you happened. He was meant to be born here. I wanted a hospital room with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge, she said, like in a movie I saw once. But no, you, she jabbed his shoulder softly with her pinky finger. You couldn't wait. You were born on the plane. On the plane, Excel said, in the sky above the ocean. He knew how the world worked. If you were born in America, you were American. If you were born in the Philippines, Filipino. So what am I, he asked. You. She looked at him for a moment, blinked a few times, as though she wasn't completely sure who she was speaking to. You, I don't know. I don't know what you are, she said. Not yet. I'll end there. Thanks so much. All right, now to the important part. Cocktail tutorial. This is the meat. The meat. This is the real reason you all came. Yeah, we're, we're very proud of our books, but this cocktail is clearly our single greatest accomplishment. It is true. And I will say that we experimented quite a bit. We did. And we had a lot of very failed cocktails. Yeah, we were very committed to the process. But we, we tried a lot of yes. cocktails. There were a lot of, it was very dangerous. Um, 
There, there were injuries, yeah. but we came up with this, which we actually both really like. We do. And it's called, the, it's very clever of us, combining our book titles, it's called The Fruit of Good Fortune. Yes. You know? Yes. It's very clever. So, um... First, can I just say that you, I know that I'm not supposed to talk for you guys. That was, those were such fantastic readings. They were beautiful readings. And, I, and I'm just really happy to get to, to interview both of you in a bit after we have our cocktails. So. Thanks, Thank Molly. You. Yeah, they, they, was, they were both fantastic. Molly, Molly's zooming in from Vermont on vacation. So yeah. this is super nice of you to do this. And, and Molly, you're going to make this along with us, too? And of course, of course. I, I'm ready. Give me our test case if you're confused yeah. about anything. Okay. So just to review ingredients, so this is called the fruit of good fortune. Um, it requires Aperol, which is like an Italian liqueur kind of thing, um, gin, uh, and cardinal gin, because cardinal, a cardinal is the state bird of Indiana, where Bruce is from. Though this is made in North Carolina, but, yeah. well, whatever. but I like the bottle too. Uh, we couldn't find fresh calamansi despite going to the ceremony farmer's market yesterday. So we just ordered pure calamansi juice. Calamansi is a kind of popular Filipino citrus. It's like a kumquat. Super tart, but also kind of sweet. Um, the, the bottled stuff works just as well. Yeah, and good. if you can't find it, use lime juice. That's yeah. you know, totally acceptable. It's just a citrus, but... And then you want um, some diced celery, which we'll show you how to use in a minute. So here's some diced celery. And that will add like just a nice little bitterness. Well, just clean. Clean, clean cleanness. Sorry, not bitterness. Clean, 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 clean. Okay. All right. So you so, can talk about the proportions. Okay. So the, okay. So the proportions. So for one drink, and if you're making multiple drinks, you'll have to take that into the consideration. Math. Right. Um, you're first going to want to if you take your, your shaker, of course, and very delicately, and add ice. Um, and then the proportions are... Yeah. Don't worry about ounces and stuff, because that's like math. So Are one part gin, okay? So we're going to do just a, a I think a jigger for a cocktail, for, for one cocktail is fine. So since we're making two, we're going to go two jiggers of gin. We have half a bottle of gin here. I guess you had a big breakfast today, which explains where the other half went. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so two. Okay, so we're making two cocktails here. We're so making two, so you make sense. So okay, and, and then, then it's half aperol, so just one aperol. So, so so for us, because we're doubling it, we're going to put one um, full jigger yeah. in this. Otherwise, you have. Does that make sense, Molly? <laughs> there will be a quiz, everyone. Okay, Molly's on board, so I'm going to trust everyone else. Okay. Okay, and then, and then. Let's see what the comments are. I'll just tell you if anyone's um, saying anything snarky in the comments while you go. <laughs> yeah, feel free, feel free to do like a teleplay or, or you know, sports <laughs> casting or whatever. <laughs> so this is the, Philip, this is what makes the drink, you know, kind of Filipino here. We're adding in the calamansi juice. Yeah, or the lime. And or the lime, or the lime. So it's, it's a half part calamansi juice. So we're going okay. to do a full jigger. So it's and then this is one this. part gin, let me review it. One part gin. <laughs> Half part Aperol, half part Calamansi. Okay, and then you put in the celery. Huh? Glory, Glory wrote that she does not remember learning this in the Stegner. <laughs> <laughs> what did we learn in the Stegner? Well, <laughs> and a lot of people said really beautiful things about, about your reading, so I'll try to save this um, while we're making these. But, yeah, we're happy to hear all the snarky comments. Yeah. Good feedback. We're happy to hear. Okay, so now comes the important part. You need to shake the shaker. Um, make sure you stretch beforehand. Don't throw out your back. Okay. Okay. So um, it's a really pretty color. It's pretty. There you go. It's very one. pretty. And here is another. And sadly, you know, as I, as I said, we couldn't we couldn't find fresh calamansi for the garnish, but you can just use a little lime rind. Yeah. Thank you. You want to do yours? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And then this this is the fruit of good fortune. We uh, 
You heard it here. We invented this a we couple did. days ago. We were looking at ways to patent it. Patent it. It's, you know, we figured we if this hit, if this goes viral, we can quit our jobs, buy a house, and I think we're we're set. Yes. All okay. right. So thank you. thank you both of you on your on your beautiful books and on such fantastic readings. And I wish we were all here together, but this is this is pretty great too. Thank thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming, and thanks to Green Apple for setting this up, and to Carr and everyone else. This is this is it's really nice to to see everyone's. Um, sorry, you guys are ready to drink. Okay, to Bruce and Leslie. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Thank you, Molly. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. 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 Pretty good. It's pretty good. Pretty good. I like it. Thanks. And it's pretty too. If you're on the treadmill, you can dab your brow like this. It is a very good <laughs> So, um, and then I also want to make a special toast because today is my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And we, before COVID, we had plans to have a big party and all these things. And of course, they're at home together alone in Indiana. So, um, I just want to. Uh, wish them a, a very happy anniversary. They're two, the two most amazing people I know. So, Mom and Dad, thank you, and uh, congratulations. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Um, I thought Molly and I were the two most amazing people you know. You're the second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. <laughs> oh, okay. great. So, can I, can I ask some questions now? Is that... Totally. Yes? Drinks. It's like everything's fine. Great. You have your drink. Um, but we can wait also. Please. Oh, well, I was, I was thinking, I mean, I really, I was really struck by both of your readings. And Bruce, um, I was thinking both when I was reading your book and then again, hearing you read from it tonight, like just how interesting it is and in the way that you examine the body in the book. So through explorations of biology and procreation, like you talked about tonight and lineage and death and the myriad ways that we construct family in the world. And I was thinking about how during your reading, you described how you saw these poems in conversation with each other. And I was wondering if you can talk about how this book finally came together as a whole for you. Like, was it something that you kind of sought out to do or did it come to you organically after you had written these poems? It kind of came, it came organically at first. I mean, I was writing, I just was writing poems, I think because we had been talking about, do we want to adopt kids? And then I think we decided we didn't want to. And, um, and I, I mean, there was a kind of loss in that for me because I'd kind of always imagined I would have kids. Um, but um, at the same time, um, I thought there were all these freedoms and great things about it. Um, and so I was really kind of writing poems about it that, that were separate. Like I was writing science-based poems. I was interested in, in, as you said, biology and all of these things. And they were accumulating and I started to realize, okay, I have a book that's kind of about, I think this thing that I've been thinking about a lot. And, um, and then I, I think when bringing it together, I had to be a little more strategic. And, and, it, and even though the book was very personal, the, all the first poems I wrote weren't personal. They were kind of these meditations on the body and all these things. And, and then I wrote this series of childless poems. So it's really the last thing I wrote that kind of was the kind of personal spine of the book. Um, and then I think I, I was also interested because I felt like I've read a lot of books that are about motherhood and about having kids, you know? It's funny, I think there are a lot more books about motherhood than fatherhood, which I'm not sure what to make of that, but I do think there are some. Um, but I, I never really read a book that was about, what if you don't have kids, right? What is, what is the narrative? And I was especially interested in the way I think that, I think children, and, and I know this just from my family, my brothers and stuff, you know, children mediate our relationship to death in interesting ways. And if you don't have that, how does that change the way we think about that, right? And we think about this notion of, of legacy and what you leave behind and, and how do you create some other story um, for the human life if you don't have that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Oh, absolutely. That's really interesting. But I've told you before, you can, you know, when you get very old, you can absolutely live with us, both of you. <laughs> so you don't have to. <laughs> Uh, I know we've talked about this a lot. We just wanted you to say that in front of all these witnesses, so. Yeah, many witnesses. And, uh, and also, you can always babysit if you're really, you know, if you're, if you're just, 
having a certain moment. Not other people's kids. Let's yeah. send it up. We would, we would love to babysit Panon. Yeah. Panon, <laughs> 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 so, uh, no, let's, I wish we could have a kid today for two hours and just play with them, <laughs> but then give them back. <laughs> and then give them back. Oh, yeah, and then be able to sleep through the night. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no, and, and something it, that makes me think of something that um that I kept wondering about uh, when I was reading your book, Leslie, and then also um, tonight hearing you read from it, I was thinking about this relationship between Excel and his mother. And I felt like both in the passage that you read tonight and also just throughout the novel, that we can feel her presence looming over him in everything he does. And even the things that he thinks about doing and isn't able to do. Like she's just sort of there in every moment. And they're both smart, they're both stubborn, and they're both very strong. And it struck me that Maxima is as physically strong as, as well as being so emotionally strong. And that was something that I felt I had really not very read about, read very much. Like so often um, immigrant mother figure, um, immigrant mother figures like don't kind of seem as physically strong and are portrayed in that way. And I was wondering if you can talk about both what it was like to write a character like her and also what it was like to develop that dynamic between the two of them. Right, well thanks for pointing that out. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I think if you read a lot of immigrant, contemporary, lit. Um, there is a kind of, I don't know if trope would be the right word, but you often see um, the mother figure with a kind of steely, quiet reserve that's only externalized maybe in a pivotal moment near the end. Um, and I certainly think that's true to experience for a lot of people. It was really important for me to have an emotionally and psychologically strong mother character in this book but who was also physically strong. I wanted her to be physically formidable. What was important for me was to have Excel at some, I think one of the challenges for Excel is whether or not he really recognizes just how strong his mother is. He recognizes and is sometimes taken aback by how physically strong she is. I mean, she can beat him up. Um, but I think, you know, learning her emotional strength behind that is, is, is one of his challenges. And I think part of the reason I wanted to do that was, well, one, as a kid growing up, I loved like the Bionic Woman, um, Linda Carter as Wonder Woman, um, Charlie's Angels, my favorite TV show of all time is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I love strong female characters who are both emotionally and physically strong. My mother was also emotionally and physically strong. Um, I remember one time in college, I, I, I was visiting home and I went upstairs and I saw my dad in one of the rooms holding a rope and the rope was like going out the window. I was like, what are you doing? And my mom was like in her 60s, had the rope tied around her waist. It was like painting the side of the house. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, are you MacGyver? What is this? And I was like, let me do it. Of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't want to do it. I'm afraid of heights. But she was, I mean, she was just so physically strong, my mom. And I just, you know, Maxima is not based on my mother, but I, it, it, there are certain aspects of her character that are inspired by her. So I really, it was so important for me to have a physically, an emotionally strong woman near the center of the book. And did that relationship just like, uh, just creating that relationship between the two of them, did that come very naturally? Or is that something you had to work on draft after draft? Oh God, that was so hard. Um, you know, I'm, I tend to be a very plot driven writer. And once I figure out the plot, I can try to figure out, okay, who are the characters who occupy this dramatic space? But after numerous drafts of, of a failed novel, I realized the only thing I cared about was this mother-son relationship. So I actually had to build a story around this mother-son relationship. And the hardest part for me about writing is, is, is developing characters and, and developing characters that I can commit to and that hopefully readers will care about. So it was, it did not come naturally at all. It was really, really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Bruce, what's the hardest part about writing this book for you? <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, like a tech, technically, like I, 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 similar to Leslie, I have a really hard time and the characters change so much draft to draft. Like what, what, what for you is the biggest challenge? In writing poems, you mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I just think, I think the biggest challenge is always just figuring out what they're really about. Like, I mean, you start at some point, I start sometimes with an image or an occasion or something, and, but that's not really the subject of the poem. And, um, sometimes I might have an interesting few lines, but I just don't know where they go. Right. The hard part, I mean, in a way it's, I mean, I always think the hard part is ending anything for me. It's like, if I have an ending, if I find my ending, I, ha I have my poem, I know that. And so, but, but finding the ending, I think is understanding finally what it's really about. And, and I mean, I always say this to my students, you know, cause I do think of writing is very much just about discovery. It's not about, 
um, you know, there, I've, there were these stories, um, uh, I mean, there are always these, I think the romantic poets in particular liked to promote this idea of the poet's genius, um, who are inspired by some greatness and they sit down and write the poem. Um, and for me, it's such a kind of back and forth, clumsy struggle to understand what it's ever really about. Mm -hmm. um, and so that for me is always the hard part. What's it about? Yeah. <laughs> And also how, I was curious about the way that you work with, re, or how the way that you as a poet approach research. I was thinking about um, both because of the subject matter and the scope of the entire book, I never felt the research. Like I, ne I never felt it at all when I was reading because I was so swept up in, in the writing itself. Um, but I imagine that this book must have required some of it, whether it's about biology or Mendel or like the incredible intricacies of, of same sex, sex adoption. And I wonder if you can talk about how you approach the research when you were writing this book and also just as a writer in general. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I don't know that I thought of it exactly as research, although I think maybe it was. Um, it was more just about reading things I was interested in and as I was thinking about some of this. And, you know, I have a poem in there, for example, called Elegy for the Girl I Was. It's based on, I read, I came across this, this um, fact, which is that for the first six weeks of conception, all embryos uh, develop as girls. And I loved it. I mean, I, I was just so loved this idea that that at least for this sort of few weeks, you know, it's just us girls somehow, that at least, at least biologically and embry, you know, embryologically, that the body is female. I just was so interested in that. And so it, it was more like that. And, and to me, what, it's never about the research. It has to be about the human drama. It has to be about people. I mean, at least what I'm interested in, I'm not interested, you know, and, and I've certainly tried, I've had drafts of failed poems that I realized the only interesting thing about this poem is, is the, the information that I've, I've read. <laughs> there's no writing, there's no human drama that's being, being um, rendered here. And yeah, so, so it's, it's about, it's always about people and human, you know, for me. Uh, and feeling, it's about feeling. Mm -hmm. And, for Le and Leslie, you were saying that for you, it kind of starts with plot and then it's figuring out a lot of these character dynamics afterward. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Counterintuitive for me. Yeah. And, but I was also thinking about in, you know, in both your story collection and in, and in your novel, um, the setting is so brilliantly rendered. And, you know, here we have Colma in your new novel, you know, it's just a short drive from San Francisco and it's filled with cemeteries. And then we have Hello City, which is, you know, this, for anyone who hasn't read the book, it's this off the grid Mecca, devoid of rules, a place where Excel can possibly feel free. And can you talk about what these places meant to you when you were writing this book? And also just what, why you were interested in exploring these two places and juxtaposing them? Right. In um, trying to figure out a place uh, to set the book, Colma just seemed um, like the perfect, the perfect setting. So for those who don't know, Colma is this town right outside San Francisco. Um, and it's most famous for having 17 cemeteries. If you die in San Francisco, uh, you actually cannot be buried in San Francisco. So a lot of people go to Colma to get buried. And in fact, um, the dead outnumber the living in Colma. Um, and so this idea that you have uh, a town most known for its dead, right on the edge of one of the most famous cities in the world seemed like not only a dramatically appropriate but also thematically appropriate setting for these characters who are undocumented who are doing their best to try to center themselves in life but who you know by necessity have to live on the fringe and have to be hidden colma seemed like the perfect opportunity for that to juxtapose that with an off-the-grid city that um allegedly promises you know, you're welcome here, do unto others, and you can just be whoever you want to be. Here is this untapped landscape where you can reinvent yourself. Um, I just really like juxtaposing those two ideas. So, so for a lot of the novel, the novel's kind of divided into two parts. There's Excel's time away from Colman in Hello City, where he tries to carve out a life and an identity for himself. Um, so you have this landscape that's so full of possibility hopefully juxtaposed with this 
kind of weird town that's just on the edge of uh, a thrumming and thriving um, city like San Francisco. It, it just, I don't know, it just made sense. And, and you know, when you're thinking, like as any writer knows, when you're thinking about setting, you're not just thinking about place, but you're thinking about how place gets activated by the concerns and the emotional life of the characters. And I thought, where would Excel and Maxima live? Where would they spend their time? And, and Colma and Hello City just seemed like um, the right places. And Hell City is fictional, but I did base it on uh, loosely on an off the grid town uh, in California called Slab City, if anyone wants to look it up. Mm -hmm. Jay, Jay, I didn't realize that. Um, so I, uh, we're starting to get some questions in. So um, I just wanted to ask you both one quick question and then, and then, we'll, um, and then I'll be opening up the Q&A and reading these questions. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, who are the, who are the writers that, um, that have just meant the most to you from the beginning? For both of you, we can, Bruce. You know, the ones who made you want to write are the ones that, you know, that you've just sort of connected to from, you know, yeah, from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the first poem I ever loved many years ago, it was sort of my gateway poem. Um, and it's funny, my, my, my friend and colleague Omar, who was here, this, who I saw, I saw, he was watching. Um, we recently did a little event, which we talked about you know, was, was there a great piece of literature you, you didn't like or, or you, you did love? And for me, the, 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 the first poem I ever loved was The Love Song of J. F. Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. I mean, I was in high school. And it's just the musicality and the kind of weird romance of that poem I loved. And it kind of got me excited about language. Um, and Omar is not a fan of that poem. Um, and, and so I, mean, I, I, no, I love that. I love how writers and, and and readers sort of disagree about these things. Um, but then the other poet I would say who, the other couple of poets would be Walt Whitman. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, that's sort of, um, I just think he had a, an influence on me. Elizabeth Bishop is a poet that I really, really love. And a poet that I don't think people talk about as much that really did have an influence on me was um, uh, James Dickey. Um, so those are some, some, a hand, I mean, a tiny, I mean, there's so many, of course, but those are a few. Uh, for me, so I'm one of those writers who didn't grow up thinking I would be a writer. Um, I didn't really start writing until later in college, which seems late compared to a lot of other people. Um, I became a writer because I took a literature course to fulfill a, a graduation requirement with a writer named Bharati Mukherjee, who is an Indian American writer. Um, when I was in college and I just, she was my professor. So I thought, why not read her book? And I read a book of hers, a collection of stories called The Middleman and Other Stories. And it was the first time that I'd read in contemporary fiction, um, you know, stories about immigrant America. Um, it was also the first time I even encountered a Filipino character in contemporary fiction. And it just felt urgent and pressing. And it was the first time when I actually thought literature can actually make a difference even now in this time. And I thought, I want to give this a shot. I want to give it a try. And um, from that point on, you know, I, I tried to make writing as central to my life as possible. But I, I've said this before, if I never met Bharati Mukherjee, I, I do not believe I would have um, become a writer. So it really is all because of her. I think. Well, that's amazing. Does she know that? She did know that. You know, she passed away in, in 2017. I was so sad about it. Um, I, I, I think she knew that. I, I, you know, I kept in touch with her and I'd sent her cards and things like that. So I, 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 hope, I hope she knew that. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Wow, that's really amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you have some questions are starting to pile up. Let's see, let's, oh, cool, this is exciting. Okay, so let's say, um, I'm trying to find, okay, okay, let's see. This is from um, Tara Runyon. Hey, Tara. Bruce, hi Tara. Uh, Bruce, what you said about your own interpretation of your poem evolving even in the short time since it was published really resonated with me. Leslie's book is also so timely to an extent that couldn't have been anticipated. Both of them made me think about our current world in a different way and I wanna thank you both for that. Oh, you're welcome. That's really <laughs> um, let's see. Um, I'm trying to find a. 
Oh, Robin says, but Molly, we're all planning to live with you. That's very exciting. Absolutely, Robin. <laughs> Um, oh, let's see. Okay, so Cameron, I don't have a last name. Cameron says, Bruce, I was wondering about the use of received form in the book. How does it relate, if you think about them as related, to the speaker's feelings on lineage and reproduction? And how did you slash do you think about the moments where you bent or broke the forms? Um, for example, the crowns of sonnets being half in crowns or the two fruit sessions not having envoys. Um, and Cameron was really fascinated by that and still can't, can't stop thinking about it. Um, and Cameron blames Alexandra Teague for the former obsessed question. <laughs> That's a great, I mean, That's a great question. That's such a smart question. The form is something, I mean, I really think poetry is so much about form and form carries meaning. Um, and for me, the received forms, I mean, I, you know, I did a reading a while back where someone kind of quoted Audrey and Rich, who kind of disavowed her earlier work because it was formal and she felt like it was keeping her away from her real subject. But I always feel like, I think the problem is, is that I, like most people, my head is full of a lot of nonsense and cliche. And when I sit down to first write, often much of what I write is trite. It's very just, and, and you know, I have a poem in the book, for example, that's this long, a form called, French form called the Villanelle, um, and uh, it's it, it's a poem that I it's it's about the first gay bar in the country to have windows, and I when I first wrote that poem I wrote it as a free verse poem, but um, it was but I had all these already ideas in my head about what I thought it was about, and 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 it became didactic and you know, um, predictable. Whereas the form, I couldn't write what I, what I thought I wanted to write. I had to sort of wrestle the form to write something. And it made me write something I didn't expect to. Um, it, 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 and I think about form as a tool for discovery. And it's this sort of back and forth, which like you have these rules, you have this set of limitations, and you, you, you bring to it a set of ideas you have about your, your subject matter. But, but it won't ever let you fully express those ideas. It makes you have to do other things. And because of that, I feel like the poem gets more surprising. Um, and it's true with the sonnets. I love this idea of the, this notion about the missing envoys um, in these sestinas, which not everybody's gonna understand this because it's poetry geek talk, um, which is that I left off this final stanza in the form. Um, but I, I um, yeah, I, I mean, I left the form, I mean, partly I left that part of the form off because I don't like that part of the form. <laughs> um, to be truthfully, it's kind of a, an awkward part. But I also was interested in the Sestina, and this is for Cameron, not everybody's gonna understand this. But I was interested in, in the Sestina because it's this weird infinite loop. If you take off that envoy, you have this repeated end words that keep going in the poem, and you come to the end and it has to start over again with the same set of words. And I don't know, there's something kind of infinite and unresolved about it when you take away that envoy. That was my feeling. And that's, again, not gonna mean only to much to poetry nerds, but, um, but in general, form is so important and received form is important because I, I think, as I tell my students, form makes me a smarter writer than I am. So. And, and, and one quick, um, quick um, follow-up question for Bruce that, oh, Oh, good. No, we're getting a lot of comments now, but D.A. Powell is asking, which James Dickey poem is your favorite? <laughs> oh, Doug. So the big one for me was The Sheep Child. And I think it's a weird poem. I mean, this is, anybody who reads this poem, it's a poem that's about having sex. It's about, you know, this sort of myth of farm boys having sex with sheep. You know, these sort of frustrated farm boys, these sort of, sort of <laughs> folklore of, of rural America, right? Like, and it's a poem that imagines that this sheep gives birth to a half-human, half-sheep child. And the poem is, and then the sheep child speaks in the poem. And I find it to be a weird, I mean, James Dickey was a weird, was sort of famously homophobic and misogynistic. But I actually feel like there's something kind of queer about this poem because it's, it's this weird nature poem. It's sort of in the way that gay people are considered 
or have traditionally considered unnatural outside of nature, this is a poem that gives a voice to something that is considered unnatural and outside of nature. And this weird half human, half sheep child speaks. And I found that to be a really exciting poem. That's what, like, probably my favorite poem of this. I'm just gonna shake really quickly. Because one of the quest a question just came in from Robin Ekes, shaken or stirred or shaken and stirred? Shaken. Shaken, okay, good. Shaken. It's also the only way I get my party in, so. And Leslie, while you shake, um, AJ Crame has a great question. Leslie, I've been so excited to recently discover you and other Filipino American writers like Elaine Castillo and Zamora Linmark. Do you have other Filipino American writers who inspire you or must read Filipino American fiction? Um, yes, uh, probably the one who inspired me the most is Jessica Hagedorn. Um, and she is someone who has been writing for a while and her, one of her most famous books is, is Dog Eaters, which came out, I think in 1990, was nominated for the National Book Award. And I just think she is someone who is, she's not only a vanguard in terms of Filipino American literature, but I, I just think she's a vanguard of, of, of contemporary literature in general. I think she is someone who's always pushing herself with each new work. Um, she's extremely supportive of, of other artists. Um, she was the one who actually adapted my story, Felix Starro, into a musical. So she ventures out into other, other kinds of art. Um, She's, she's just wonderful. Um, another uh, story writer would be Mia Alvar, who wrote In the Country, who's really wonderful and a uh, really gifted writer. Yeah, yeah I, I really, I really like that book too. I really appreciate that. And, um, and uh, Otis Hashemeyer says, you're both writers. Do you read each other's work? How do you help each other? And how does working in fiction work on, differ from working in poetry? Otis. Otis. <laughs> um, such a gotcha question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is the gotcha journalism? Is so Otis. So Otis. Um, you know, I, I, I actually do feel very fortunate that um, I live with a writer, and I sometimes wonder if it's beneficial to live with a writer who's not in the same genre. Not, not because it's, I'm, I'm not concerned about like a com competition or anything like that, but I just think that as a poet, Bruce is also paying attention to language instinctively. Um, not that fiction writers aren't, but I just think, I think he's just very good at, at, at editing my work. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, editing on the story level. Um, there are a lot of benefits to living with another writer. I mean, when we both have these long stretches of time away from work, we both understand that writing is a priority and, and most vacations we take, for better or for worse, usually somehow involve writing. Um, but the downside to it, of course, is that we <laughs> often have the same anxieties. Um, and sometimes our lives feel dictated by writing and, and we both teach writing. And, you know, sometimes I think, ah, why didn't I find that investment banker? Um, but I but think, it's not too late. It's I think that too. Late. There's still, that. you think that too, okay. I mean, this is your first, this is, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I feel very fortunate. It, it, yeah. it works out quite well. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's very useful. No, I share, we share work and um, yeah, and it works. We're, we actually don't have any issues. It's, it's actually super just practical. Like, will you read this? Give me feedback. We've only had a couple of fights. <laughs> and you're both each other's first editors, aren't you? Yes. Yes, yeah, although, actually. Because yes. no one, other than, other than my agent, my editor, no one, I don't, I, no one read the book. I mean, I have a couple of friends, Tar and Serena, read really early drafts, but then you're the only one I, who... I show... My first reader is... I have a really good friend, Charles Leslie, sure. who I think is watching. From Abu Dhabi. From Abu Dhabi. It's like five a.m. And she's usually my first reader. I mean, she's... I'm, with poetry, at least. I mean, she's always my first reader. And really with everything. And then... Um, and I have a couple other friends that I do share work with and get feedback. Say, my friend Sarah and, and others. But... Um, but I, I will, especially when I have a question about story or character in a poem, I'll really have Leslie read it and say, what do you think? And he's good at questioning those things. Um, so this is a strong drink. <laughs> um, so let, um, I'm hope I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, Kathleen Dorn, D-O-A-R-N. Um, Kathleen says, hi, Leslie. I've been wondering this since I finished your book. 
Do you ever think about what Excel would be up to now? I guess I'm wondering if you feel a connection with Excel and Maxima, like friends you once knew. Um, I do wonder. I do wonder what they're up to now. I don't know the answer to that, but I, I appreciate the question because I think one of the things I'm going for in my work with, with, with ending stories or novels is that you hope that there is this sense of possibility that even though you have the final word and the final punctuation at the end of the book, you hope there's still possibility off the page. So I, I wonder about it, but I, I, I don't know what he's doing at all. Um, I think I'd leave him, well, I won't say where I leave him, but um, I don't know what his next step is. Um, and I actually kind of like the fact that I don't know. Matthew Urbane is saying Coma the Musical. The suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> there, is a, there is a musical. It's called Filipino Musical. It's awesome. Yeah. It's a Filipino musical. It's all Filipino actors. It's great. You can watch it, I think, on online somewhere. I highly recommend it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, Chris uh, Dizon D -I -Z -O -N, D -Z -O -N, um, asked both of you, what should every aspiring writer do before they die? <laughs> <laughs> this drink. Make this cocktail. <laughs> Make this cocktail. Yeah, there are uh, actually a lot of questions about the cocktail in the chat. I'm trying to sift through them. Oh, there are. Uh, we'll take cocktail those questions. Are, for those sure. are the we're, most we're happy important to those questions. Um, whatever you want to do before they die. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I think write, 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 write the sentence that 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 really mattered to you. Make sure you get that one sentence down, even if, even if it's just a sentence. And, and hopefully, if you leave it behind, hopefully somebody will stumble across it. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take his answer. Yeah. Oh, you, you, <laughs> you're piggybacking on Leslie's. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? I like it. Uh, I like that a lot, too. Yeah. Or I was trying to think about, like, just, you know, just trying to write the book that you wish someone else had written. Yeah. Yeah, that too, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is from Hanan Tige. He says, hi, long-time fan, first-time caller. My question is about the cocktail. Given the presence of celery in the beverage, will I burn more calories drinking it than are in the drink itself? Can you guarantee that I will lose weight if I drink several thousand of them? Yeah, yes. Uh, I think so. I, we lost about 13 pounds, you know, <laughs> shaking this drink. It's a very rigorous cocktail. Yeah, you've got to stretch before you make this drink. <laughs> you really do. And hydrate before making the drink. Um, we, we believe safety first. That's that's one of our tenets in this house. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's I think it's as I said, it's good cardio. For sure. Yes, you will lose weight in this drink. Yes, especially in on. Yeah, especially. I mean, with all you know, with all this pandemic weight, so. <laughs> 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 and Stuart Weiss um, is asking, when not in a fruit of good fortune, how and in what is calamansi used? Oh, calamansi is used to marinate some things. Um, most often, it's, it's kind of like the way you might use a lemon to just sort of squeeze on something, like a piece of like grilled chicken or, or like um, pancit, which is a, a Filipino noodle dish. Um, so it's often used like at a Filipino meal, you might have a bowl of like calamansi and you just squeeze it on your, you know, on your, on your, on the, on, on your food. Mm -hmm. um, but it can also be used to make like drinks. I remember um, we would make, my mother had this beautiful, beautiful calamansi tree um, that she grew and we, we, we just sold the house. Um, so for a while we had, you know, endless supplies of, of calamansi. We would make like, instead of lemonade, like a calamansi aid. And it was wonderful. I, I hadn't known about it until you sent the until you sent the ingredients. And uh, yeah, okay, I'm trying to find. Um, so we are coming up at. Oh yes, okay. We we should probably close soon. We have so many questions. I'm gonna try to cut and paste these questions so that you can see everyone. People are also just writing a lot of really lovely comments. Um, and I just have a. What's that? Should I read some of them? 
Are you beeping out? Oh, no. Um, so I, I was just curious. I, I mean, first of all, I just want to say I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and also for these really, really lovely comments and questions. And I'm cutting and pasting them right now to, to, to send them over to Bruce and Leslie. Um, but, you know, you two, you're in addition to being uh, two of my favorite writers, you're also just two of my favorite people. And so it's just such a, a great thing to get to to do this and to have this much fun um, celebrating your books and just and, and hanging out and seeing all of these people here in the in, in the comments here. Uh, and I and I have a, a question for both of you. Uh, is is there a writer who also has a book out now who you know who you think is really fantastic and whose book you'd love to recommend? While we have this group here, um, I would recommend uh, Melanie Conroy Goldman. She wrote a book called The Likely World, which is out from Red Hand Press. It's this kind of trippy, intense, uh, and beautifully written book about addiction to this fictional drug, but it's also about um, motherhood and addiction and um, it's just utterly original. Check it out. The Likely World, Melanie Conway Goldman. We have so many people, so many great folks out um, right now. Um, my friend Charles Leslie has an amazing book called The Explosive Expert's Wife that I would really recommend to everybody. Um, my friend Sarah um, has an amazing book called, the Gray, called Gray Matter. Um, and actually, Stuart Weiss, who just oh, asked right. a question, has this amazing book out about superstition, the history of superstition, that we recommend to Very cool. You should check it out. And our friend Joseph Mazur. Yes, Joe. It's a book about time. Time, and, and, yeah. a wonderful book. Um, uh, M-A-Z-U-R. Yeah, check Joe Mazur, M-A-Z-U-R. Check that out. So many good books. This is our, the problem. <laughs> we know too many writers. Too many good writers. I know. Um, we before I forget, um, for those of you who buy our books from um, one or the other, whatever, um, from Green Apple, if you email us, um, we will, sorry, I'm going to show my email address. We will, um, if you email us with a proof of receipt, we'll send you those um, bookmark things. And these are our addresses. Um, uh, LeslieT at gmail.com and bhsnyder at yahoo.com. If you go to our websites, our, ha our homemade websites, you can also contact us that way. And absolutely, and absolutely, I mean, they're both just such beautiful books. So everyone, please do order them and you can order them from Green Apple. And also you two are doing a signing tomorrow. Is that, what, what time is that tomorrow? A socially distanced signing? It's I'm at the bookstore. Socially distanced. We'll be there masked. Yeah. If you're around, you're there. So please Bye. come by and support Bruce and Leslie and support Green Apple. And thanks to everyone for coming. And I, we got so many, there are so many comments and questions. I couldn't get to all of them. They're still appearing. Um, but also just a lot of really lovely things where people are saying. And it seems that everyone also tried the cocktail. So we're getting a lot of comments about that. So with those questions or let us know what you thought about the cocktail. Yeah. I'm especially interested in opinions on the cocktail. Yeah, me too. That's the most important. There are many of them. So I'll send you all of them so you can get to them and, you know, and, and be in touch with some of the folks here. So thanks to everyone for coming. And congratulations, Bruce and Leslie. I'm blowing you both a kiss. I'm blowing you a kiss back. Thank and, you, Molly. And to everyone else out there, thank you so much. Thanks so thank much, everyone. Listening. Bye. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. And, apps, and all you San Franciscans, definitely go and, and see them tomorrow for the signing. Stay healthy. Wear your masks. Stay healthy. Cheers. Cheers, guys. <laughs>